is that um, oh right so um, so when we try the transition in finite time what we see is that uh, domains form uh, and causally separated regions of the system uh, have different uh, uh, spin alignments yes so uh, or in one specific domain, we will have a, a, a value of the magnetization. And in the adjacent domain, uh, chances are that the spins are pointing in a, along a, diff, a different direction. And at the interface between uh, these adjacent domains, I will have a, a topological defect. So you may wonder how the uh, resulting mosaic of domains depends on uh, the time scale in which I uh, drive the uh, transition. And you can expect that if you do it very slowly, you get large domains which ex extend over the whole system size. If you do it quickly, by contrast, you probably get lots of small domains with lots of excitations, lots of topological defects, in this case, dom uh, domain walls. So this is a basic idea, which is uh, discussed by the so-called Kibel-Surek mechanism. And uh, Tom Kibel and Wojciech Surek uh, came out independently with a power law prediction for the average uh, domain size as a function of the quench time. And uh, this was, uh, you know, the key prediction is that this is a power law dependence with the quench time, which is universal with equilibrium uh, critical exponents, new and set, uh, uh, set in the, the, this, this, this is scaling. Now, so this is all, you know, the early works for, were for classical, continuous thermal phase transitions. And uh, the question arises as, to similar results hold in the quantum domain. And uh, we know the answer is yes. This is uh, the first works were done in 2005. And uh, essentially, uh, you know, so there was works by Polkovnikov, Damsky, Yarmaga, Zurich, Dorner, and Scholler. What they did is to consider the one dimensional transverse field easy model. So this is a exactly solvable model that exhibits a quantum phase transition between a paramagnetic phase when the magnetic field G is very large and a ferromagnetic phase, doubly degenerate, with all the spins either pointing up or pointing down uh, when G is uh, smaller than one. And it turns out that this uh, simple Hamiltonian can be written down in terms of uh, quasi three fermions, um, you know, uh, after doing a jordan Birkner transformation, and uh, a Fourier transform, uh, you, you, you can write it down in terms of independent two-level systems, so to speak. And uh, so this is the model which was used to test whether Kibel Zurek works on the quantum case and to measure the number of kinks. Uh, you know, so the, one can use the kink number operator uh, defined in this way, which essentially just counts the number of spins misalignments between adjacent domains. You go through the chain uh, with this sum and you just pick up the number of uh, spin configurations, which are either up, down, or down, up. And it so happens that the, uh, this is kink number operator has this very simple form also in the uh, fermionic representation, just the sum of the occupation numbers in, in its mode. Right, so to drive the phase transition, you can vary in time the magnetic field from a large value to a small value and say that you can linearize the behavior, uh, the time dependence uh, in this way, introducing a time scale uh, tau q. Yeah? Uh, so what this works with um, by a set of analytical and numerical approaches is to show that the uh, expectation value of the kink number operator, the final non-equilibrium state, scales uh, with the square root of the inverse quench time. And this is uh, consistent with the uh, prediction of the kibel schreck mechanism when you, we choose uh, critical exponents new and z equal to one. Here, this becomes one half, and the inverse of this gives us the square root we, we are seeing here. Good. So. Uh, by now, you know, so this was in 2005, there have been many works uh, supporting uh, the kibel surek mechanism, both with analytical methods and numerical methods uh, for integrable systems, also numerical works for non-integrable systems. And one can say that there is a whole range of experiments that are also consistent with the kibel surek mechanism. And it's nice to see that there's been a flow of ideas from the other works by Kibel and cosmology to condensed matter, quantum simulation, and finally, quantum computing. Uh, I, want this, I want to say something uh, that lies beyond the scope of the conventional kibel schreck mechanism, and is the fact that there exist universal features in the non-equilibrium dynamics in, uh, that concern the full counting statistics of kinks, of topological defects. Uh, so not just the mean number, as the kibel schreck will uh, determine, scales with the quench time, but also all features of the distribution of topological defects. So this is based on works of 2018 and 2020. 
to see how this comes about, uh, you can consider exactly the same setting as in the 2005 works. And instead of just looking at the average number of the, uh, of the expectation value of the king number operator, you can look at the eigenvalue statistics. So the probability that the, uh, a given eigenvalue is observed as a measurement outcome when you uh, measure the king number operator. So we, we look at the probability to find a given number of kinks n, lowercase n. And you know, this is a Kronecker uh, delta function, so it's nice to make use of a Fourier transform and introduce the characteristic function, which is just a Fourier transform of the, of the kink number distribution. Now, remember that the kink number operator uh, had a very nice form uh, in, in Fourier space in, in, in the language of free fermions. It was just the sum of the occupation numbers. And this is what allows me to, you know, the characteristic function is just the exponential of a Hermitian operator. And this Hermitian operator is just the sum of uh, the occupation numbers. And thanks to this feature, I can explicitly write down the uh, characteristic function as the product of, you know, the probability to create a, a, a pair of kinks and the probability one minus PK of not creating any kink. Um, so we are, we are considering the, the one dimensional transverse field model on a ring. Uh, with periodic boundary conditions, uh, so uh, momentum is conserved and kinks appear in pairs uh, with k and minus k. Um, and uh, we know already from the works of uh, um, 2005 that we can estimate the probability for kink formation or for pair of kinks for uh, kink pair formation using the Landau Center formula, uh, which tells us that it decreases exponentially with the quench time. So the slower we go, the much lower. Uh, is the um, uh, formation probability. And it also uh, decreases uh, as a Gaussian with the wave number. So high energy kinks are harder to create. Uh, <clears throat> because we essentially have the characteristic function, we have the kink number distribution. So let, let's take a look at it. Uh, so this is numerically exact uh, simulation for three different quench times. When I write the phase transition from the paramagnet to the ferromagnet, I count the number of kinks in the non-equilibrium state that I get in the uh, ferromagnetic phase. And if I go very fast, I see that the kink number is high and the distribution is broad. If I go more slowly, I see that the mean of the distribution shifts to lower values and the distribution also becomes narrower. Yeah? And when I go very slow, I do have the probability of getting uh, no defects at all. So it, this will be this limit over here. Um, <clears throat> Right, so these are histograms, and we can just uh, use, uh, so I mean, theoretically derive a Gaussian approximation, a normal approximation to uh, these histograms, which works well far away from the onset of adiabatic dynamics. So, in particular, for uh, fast quenches, uh, this uh, the histogram is very nicely matched by this Gaussian, which has the property that it is centered at the prediction by the kibel schreck mechanism. So, this universal scaling law with the quench time. And also has the feature that the variance is proportional to the mean. It's not equal to the mean, so it's not a Poissonian distribution, but it's proportional to it. Uh, right. So the, you know this is you know just a normal approximation, uh, but you know uh, clearly there are non non Gaussian features. Uh, so let's try to characterize it a bit further. And in order to do that, uh, we just take the logarithm of the characteristic function and use the textbook expansion to generate cumulants. So this is the cumulant generating function, the logarithm of the Fourier transform of the distribution of interest. And it has this expansion in terms of cumulants. Well, we can compute in close form this logarithm, uh, this cumulant generating function is given by this integral. And uh, if we take the limit of slow quenches, uh, this integral reduces to this very simple expression, which states that uh, you know essentially the cumulant generating function is proportional to the mean number of defects predicted by the kibel schreck mechanism up to some uh, numerical factor uh, which depends on some special function now if i compare this equation with this equation i can conclude that all cumulants are proportional to the density to the mean density to the average number of kinks and therefore will scale with the same power law as a function of the quench time uh, right, so let's you know let's just give some examples. For instance, we can look at the mean uh, of the number of kinks. This is predicted by keep, you know matches the prediction, and of course it scales with the quench time. But we can look at the variance. The variance is also proportional to the mean, and therefore will also scale with the quench time. Same thing with the third uh, cumulant it equals to the third center moment up to a numerical factor is proportional to the mean. And you know every cumulant, no matter how high, will have this this uh, feature. Uh, so you know, if you want to visualize it, you can just 
do numerical simulations for you know finite chains, say 500 spins. And uh, as a function of the quench time, you see that the cumulant, not just the density, so this is the, the top one is the density, but also the variance, the fluctuations in the kink number, or the third center uh, moment of the kink number, all have this nice power law behavior with the same slope. So all of them uh, follow the same uh, scaling with the quench time. Um, you see, of course, that uh, they, are, they are sifted by uh, these numerical prefactors we just uh, illustrated. And that there are deviations that you expect, uh, given a finite system size, there's always a quench time when you start to probe the onset of adiabatic dynamics, because you know the uh, defect number is very low and the uh, coherence length scale is of the order of the system size. We also have deviations when we go very fast, and this is to be expected because we use the Landau Center formula to estimate, um, you know, to, to, to come out with these predictions. And the Landau Center formula uh, uh, works well only when the uh, quenches are sufficiently slow. So it's, it's not quite correct. In, at fast quenches, you will have to use uh, some uh, cylindric, uh, parabolic cylindric functions that we don't want to use because they're a bit messy. Uh, <clears throat> the new prediction is clear. You know, cumulants scale with the, uh, are proportional to the mean and therefore inherit the uh, scaling with the quench time uh, predicted by the kibel schreck mechanism. And, you know, so everything I have said is for uh, quasi free Fermi models, but we have a series of works showing that this is much more general. So we have tested in uh, classical field theories in, uh, in the context of holography for, uh, you know, uh, superconductors and, and, and so on. Yeah, some uh, classical spin models and, and more. So this, you know, it's, it's, we expect this to hold very generally. So we, with this understanding, we uh, went to uh, test to what extent uh, the way machines, uh, quantum Manila, uh, behave uh, according to the expectations. And this is the work uh, I want to present with uh, the group of Hidetoshi Nishimori, Sei Suzuki, Daniel Lidar, and uh, many other authors. I think I have a picture of some of them. So this is Hidetoshi Nishimori when I visited him in Japan, Daniel Lidar and Fernando, who was a part of my group uh, uh, until recently. Right, so what we did is to uh, essentially embed the one dimensional transverse field model in uh, you know, two, two machines to which we had access. Uh, a peculiarity of these machines is that when you change the magnetic field, uh, you also have to change the uh, coupling between the spins. Uh, so the schedules involve both a change of the uh, you know, magnetic field and uh, of the ferromagnetic interactions. We can change the sign of the interactions, they can be ferro, anti ferro. And uh, we had access to two different machines, what, uh, one at NASA, the other one at uh, D-Wave Inc. in Burnaby. And uh, this one happens to have a bit of lower noise. So uh, that will explain some of the differences uh, that we see. Um, one remarkable thing about uh, using you know, this, this uh, uh, set of experiments is that we were able to embed them, you know, we embed the easing chain uh, through self-avoiding random walks in 200 different ways. Um, and for each uh, embedding, we collect uh, a thousand ex uh, runs of, of you know so different uh, experiments. We, we run them uh, one thousand times. So for every quench time and for every system size that we consider, we do have two hundred thousand uh, uh, realizations. And this is extremely high when you compare it with any other uh, previous platform that has been used to study a uh, kibel schreck mechanism, which has been the subject of decades of research with colloid superconductors. Um, both Einstein condensates and so on, but they always have, you know, way, way poorer statistics. Uh, right, so we, we collect this, uh, this data, we essentially measure the density of kinks upon completing the annealing schedule, and we uh, look at the scaling of the density of kinks with the quench time in one machine, in a different machine. Uh, we do it for different system sizes, starting at uh, 50 up to 800, and uh, what we see is that when the uh, chain is large enough, all the data happens to be consistent, uh, but the uh, chains that are very small, uh, 50 spins or so, uh, behave uh, differently. And uh, we, we can see also this even uh, numerically, uh, you know, with numerical simulation. So we essentially discard this system size. It's like just too small for uh, what we want to study. Now, uh, what we do then, sorry, uh, um, is to collect the, the you know we try to we fit uh, power law scalings you know we fit power laws to this to this data and uh, in that way we extract um, uh, kind of experimental uh, uh, Kibel-Sure power law exponent 
In one of the machines, uh, for sufficiently, you know, for large system size, it's around 0.2. In the other machine, it's around 0.33. Uh, so one important obvious thing is that the two machines have different behavior. I already anticipated one. One of them has lower noise. The other one, uh, you know, has a bit higher level of noise. Uh, but importantly, none of the machines behaves as we expect in theory, where the exponent that we expected is one half, so it was 0.5. And we, we clearly have here uh, exponents in disagreement with that. Uh, so right now it comes to the question, you know, what 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 does explain this uh, this power law uh, behavior? Yeah, um, and <clears throat> we can uh, try to uh, study different candidates. So one one thing you can see, you know, we have plot here uh, the power law exponent observing one machine, point uh, two in a different machine, point thirty four. And the theoretical expectation is one half, so it's uh, way out of, of what we see. Uh, so the machine is therefore not consistent with the isolated transverse field ISIM model. And uh, the question is what, what other possible explanations are there? And so one of, of the questions is whether the machine is consistent, you know, or can be described by some classical model. In particular, we consider a classical model of planar rotors evolving under Monte Carlo updates. Uh, this is the so called spin vector Monte Carlo model. And uh, the scaling is also very different from that seen in the machines. What we did next is to consider a model of an open system, which is, has been introduced before. It's quite a standard. Uh, you know, you couple its spin uh, of the ISIM chain to a local environment of harmonic oscillators. And uh, that happened to uh, lead to a power law behavior which expands, you know, it, uh, depending on the, on the coupling. To the bath, it covers a range of um, uh, exponents, uh, which covers the, the, those uh, seen in the B wave data. Yeah. So, with this candidate model or explanation in mind, we will have then the first test of the Kippel's rate mechanism in a many body open quantum system. So, this is a landmark study, in, you know, after, uh, say, for four or five decades. I guess Kibble's work was introduced in the 70s. So, you know, it's nearly half a century of research, pretty much sustained uh, of experimental studies trying to probe uh, these universal scaling laws. And uh, there are recent experiments on the quantum domain for isolated systems, but this will be the first study for a dissipative quantum system in the laboratory. Yeah. Uh, so, let me tell you a bit more about the model we have based on an open system. So, we take the easing chain. And each of the spins uh, to the sigma set coupling uh, is coupled to, to a harmonic oscillator. We assume an ohmic spectral function with a, a sharp cutoff. We have this parameter eta uh, that we can uh, essentially tune to the scales with the frequency. And um, there are early works, I think, from uh, mid 90s uh, by Subir Sagdev and Felix von Oppen showing that this kind of coupling does not destroy the phase transition in the transverse field quantum easy model, but it does change uh, the critical exponents in such a way that uh, the correlation and critical exponent varies from 1 to 0.64, and the dynamic critical exponent uh, nearly doubles. Yes. Uh, so what we did then is um, to run different kind of numerics. Uh, essentially, uh, we were able to simulate at, uh, CO temperature, also a finite temperature, but let me just focus on this because it has the, the feature that um, we, we can collect. I mean, we can look at the density of kinks as a function of the annealing time and up to some transients that appear uh, when we go fast. Essentially, uh, uh, for slow quenches, a power law behavior sets in, in which the power law exponent that you can fit to numerical data uh, varies in, in the range that you expect from the one half, which is what happens for the system in isolation, uh, all the way to the values that were observed in one of the machines at Burnaby and the values that were observed in the other machine. Um, right. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, so so with this model of uh, dissipative easing chain, uh, we probe, uh, look at the critical dynamics, uh, you know, is consistently reproduce uh, the data collected in, in the, the web uh, annealing devices. Um, this does not preclude the existence of other classical models that may uh, capture this behavior. But this is the most reasonable explanation. In particular, it is the only one that interpolates between the uh, system in isolation and the values observed. <clears throat> uh, so let me tell you about the classical models we, we consider. In the work, uh, uh, we look at the spin vector Monte Carlo model that I already briefly mentioned, in which each spin 
is uh, replaced by a O2 planar rotor, classical planar rotor. Uh, therefore, we cannot mimic the anti, you know, we have to mimic the anti commutativity of the uh, different quantum, uh, you know, the pa Paulis in the spin language. So, while we do the magnetic field goes as the sine, the ferromagnetic interactions go as the cosine. So, when one is zero, the other is, is maximum. And what we do is to, uh, Monte Carlo updates <clears throat> um, and, you know, uh, see whether this is able to capture uh, when we change the schedules for the magnetic field and the ferromagnetic interactions as a function of uh, Monte Carlo steps uh, to in, in induce the phase transition uh, where this uh, gives rise to a density of defects that scales with the annealing time as uh, seen in the uh, machines. And the answer is no, you know, we, uh, with these kind of numerical simulations, the scaling of the density of defects with annealing time is uh, has a exponent nearly one half, uh, which is uh, completely different from the one observed uh, for in the machines. And, but it's interesting to see that uh, this kind of numerics already uh, shows that uh, for a small system size, we have very different behavior and that justifies why we also got rid of uh, the small system size data. And we just look at uh, large, large chains. <clears throat> Now, I, when, when we did this work, you know, some of the collaborators say, well, you know, this is the only game in town if you want to uh, mimic, uh, you know, came out with a classical candidate that accurately describes D-Wave, uh, this is what you have to use, yes, yeah? so the, the, the spin vector of Monte Carlo. And, you know, I have a quick reaction, you know, like, uh, yes, from uh, statistical physics, you know, that you can uh, or uh, come out with an alternative model where instead of considering Monte, Monte Carlo updates, I could, for instance, consider other kind of update dynamics. I could consider some time continuous dynamics, perhaps much better suited to describe the annealing process. For instance, I could do Glauber dynamics, so I could do Langevin dynamics. Yes, and Langevin dynamics has the advantage that apart from introducing uh, a noise, um, a kind of effective temperature in its spin, we also introduce a dissipation, uh, a dissipation time scale or a dissipation rate, um, a friction coefficient, which is what is lacking in the Monte Carlo uh, models. Yes. Um, well, being a Langevin method, it also satisfies fluctuation dissipation theorem. And essentially, we will you know, put this as a new benchmark, classical benchmark, uh, to raise the bar of the um, what, what could be uh, considered as non-classical behavior. Yeah? Because this spin vector Langevin model, which is classical, captures a much broader set of behavior than the spin vector Monte Carlo model. In particular, we can see that you know these are classical numerical simulations for this spin classical model, the spin vector Langevin model, that show that just by changing the uh, friction coefficient, we can alter. Uh, with, you know, after some transients, we essentially set into a power law regime, and uh, the power law exponent it's dependent on the uh, friction coefficient gamma, and we can tune this in a range of values. The range of values is not as good as in the theory of an open quantum system. I cannot recover the behavior of a system in isolation. Uh, but, you know, it is interesting that it covers uh, part of the behavior seen in, in the D-Wave machine. Um, this is not to say that the D-Wave machine is classical, but you can completely, uh, I mean, already conclude there is no chance, you know, that you have a classical algorithm, a classical method that has the same performance. So if you were interested in quantum supremacy in this context, uh, there will be no chance. Yeah. <clears throat> right, so uh, let me just close by uh, mentioning uh, the physics beyond the kibble sort mechanism. So I mentioned we can look at the full counting statistics of kinks. And uh, this is what we see here. Instead of just looking at the mean, this is the uh, data collected from uh, the D-Wave. And we see histograms uh, for different quench times. Uh, as we go uh, more slowly, uh, the mean number uh, and the, this, uh, the mean number reduces and the distribution becomes narrower, precisely as we have anticipated in theory. Uh, we can uh, make uh, normal distribution fits, uh, Gaussian fits that um, are accurately match uh, the expectations. <clears throat> you know, so this Gaussian approximation works very well. Um, what you know, what we can do beyond you know, just using normal fits is look at the scaling of the cumulants. And again, this is uh, uh, data collected from D-Wave. Uh, you see the first cumulant, the density, the variance, and the first center moment all sharing a beautiful power law with the annealing time. Of course, the uh, error bars grow as you go to higher order cumulants, but thanks to the fact that we had 200,000 realizations for its annealing time, we uh, can, you know, with some confidence claim that we also see even power law scaling for the third cumulant, yeah? which I think is quite remarkable. And I think it will be very difficult with other physical platforms. Uh, <clears throat> because all the scaling, all the cumulants uh, follow the same power law scaling, 
um, their ratios will be independent of the annealing time. Uh, we can look at the cumulant ratios. And indeed, up to error bars, they are constant. Uh, what is remarkable is that the constant uh, determining these uh, cumulant ratios is the same as in the system in isolation. So, you know, whether where the system is dissipative or isolated, uh, the cumulant ratios have the same constant value. So, the only thing that uh, the dissipation does is to alter the power law scaling uh, of the mean density. But cumulant ratios are independent of whether the system is dissipative or not. That shows that the shape of the distribution is very robust against uh, the coherence of you know, um, non unitary dynamics. Um, this is also a feature that can be reproduced by, uh, to some extent, by the uh, spin vector Langevin model. And the, uh, you know, we, we, if, uh, we look at numerically uh, the cumulant ratios uh, of the, uh, this classical system, and they uh, happen to have also a value which is essentially uh, uh, matching the that of the uh, of seen in this machine. Uh, right. So I guess the take-home message is, you know, so we have tested also. Uh, Physics that lies beyond the Kibelschweck mechanism uh, using D wave. Uh, we saw that the distribution has a specific form. I, I think I forgot to mention it's Poisson binomial. So it's essentially like throwing um, N bias coins with different biases. So it's a classical distribution we, we know well. <coughs> uh, and the shape of the distribution is robust against the coherence. So the only effect of the coupling to the path is essentially altering the scaling law of the mean density. Uh, right. So this is actually the first test of. Uh, you know, of, of universality in the full count in statistics of topological defects and um, in any system that, that, that I know of. So, you know, I think this is also very nice from the point of view of non-equilibrium statistical physics. Uh, you know, some of some of you, I, you will be more interested in annealing than on the statistical physics. And therefore, you, you, you may perceive as bad news that uh, these machines were uh, described as an open system in the regime of annealing times that we consider. Uh, or uh, then you may be interested in knowing that uh, the uh, D-Wave essentially reproduce our study, uh, simply going to shorter annealing times. And uh, what they found is that in that case, uh, you can suppress the effect of the coherence. So they do find behavior which is consistent with uh, that of the transverse field easy model in isolation. So you go fast, you know, then uh, the buff has uh, less time to, to act on your system. The dynamics is approximately unitary. And uh, they did look at the, um, uh, uh, histograms of the full counting statistics and the cumulant, cumulant scaling, and they do find now nice agreement with the uh, standard transverse field easy model without the need to um, invoke the coupling with a with a bath. All right, so with this I close. You know, so from you know we have provided the first test of kibel surek in an open quantum system, and all the first test of physics beyond the kibel surek mechanism. And in doing so, we have you know trying to rule out classical performance. We introduce also this benchmark. Uh, spin vector Langevin model, which I think is uh, is complementary, but in some sense uh, broader than the spin vector Monte Carlo model. Yeah, um, and you know here are the, the result I present is more or less in, in these works. Uh, so yeah, I think you all. Very much, Dolfo. Very nice. Lots of interesting uh, ideas as always. Thank you. Um, and I'm now happy to open this up for questions. So if you have a question, either just speak up or put something in the chat or raise your hand. Usual Zoom etiquette applies. Okay. Can I ask a question? Yes, Lorenzo, go ahead. Hi, Lorenzo Campos from uh, yeah, USC. Um, I, I missed the beginning of your talk. I had also, um, sorry about that. But I think uh, there was also some issue with recording. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> no worries. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes. So, um, I, I mean, I don't remember exactly, but shouldn't the the the, the distribution of the number of kinks uh, under at criticality also depend uh, somehow on the form of the schedule? Uh, you know. The, so that, that's a good question. I will say that uh, you know what what well, I we, we collect the, the the standard Kibazurik assumes like a ne a linear schedule. Yes. And yes. I think generalized to to power laws, but the. But yes, it's yes, 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 yes. even more complicated yes. than that, right? So it's uh... yes. So 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 you know. So this is a beautiful question. There were some works in 2008. Uh, I remember by Singupta and also by uh, Barankov and Polkovnikov, showing that if you instead of considering a linear quench 
you use a nonlinear a nonlinear quench and you know you really match the the nonlinearity around the critical point then you can change the dependence the scaling of the density of defects with the annealing time or with the quench time uh, has to be modified and there's a theory for that now uh, we have not uh, so what we did is to make sure that this was not happening here because as you saw the annealing schedules in in the machine are not linear you know they do have some so the first worry we have when we uh, you know is that this is you know, you can linearize it, but this is not uh, the kind of linear schedule that we wanted. So, you know, we considered this and, and we realized that this was not, uh, uh, you know. So for, for this have to be the case, the nonlinearity has to be very precisely uh, matched around the critical point. And it was already pointed out in other works that if you know, you know, if there's a, a bit of an offset, then even if your nonlinear schedule, you can linearize it again and you are back to the standard uh, scaling of the, um, with the, you know, for the density of defects. Uh, so this is for you know just for the mean density. Uh, from the theory, you know, from the essentially the the, the uh, characteristic function, I would expect that the shape of the distribution does not depend at all on the uh, schedule because the only thing that the schedule does is to change the mean density. And what we have seen is, is that the uh, uh, the expression for the cumulants, you know, all the cumulants are proportional to the mean density. So what is going to to change is the scaling with the quench time. The cumulant ratios will be constant, will be independent of the schedule you use. Does that answer the uh, question? Yeah. But it's a very good question. We, we, we were worried about it and we, we tried to rule this out. Yeah, I think we ruled yeah. it. So you didn't do pneumatics for for like the the isolated uh, native. Uh... We we did pneumatics, you know, in this study with the Nishimori leader, Suzuki and so on. We, we, we did pneumatics simply to rule out the, the possibility that these schedules were altering the Kibel Surek scaling. So, you know, instead of having to invoke a, a buff or a coupling to a buff, uh, you know, we could just have say, oh, well, you know, this is just because the, the system is unitary, but we are using a nonlinear schedule. This could yeah, still, yeah. Uh, be a mechanism to alter the power. Uh, but this we rule out. Yeah? Um, you know, from the point of view of, of statistical physics, I think there's no work out there that has looked at the full continent statistics with nonlinear schedules, though I do have the expectations that I mentioned about it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, Polkovnikov, I think, I mean, uh, I think his paper is a bit more... Yeah, yeah, he did for the density. And before him, there was a, a paper by, you know, Chris Dendus and Gupta and some, some uh, Mondal and, and some other collaborators. So there was a work in uh, several people in India. I think we should... Great. Thank you very much, Lorenzo. We should probably move on. Uh, Alex uh, Zagoski yes. has a question. Yeah, right. Uh, what is the decoherence time for a single qubit in your case? Um, um, I, I, I will... I, um, I wouldn't know how to answer this question uh, very well. <laughs> the, yeah. Say about uh, a microsecond. Uh, I mean, our, our quenches go to 100 microseconds and uh, the we actually collected data up to uh, 1000 microseconds and the, the specification of the machine uh, says that, you know, there are different kinds of right. mechanisms, not just the coherence, coming out uh, beyond 100 microseconds. So we essentially took uh, broader data. I don't know what I have here, the, the plots. You know, I, uh, I think, I'm not sure we saw this in the paper. Um, we, um, sorry, let me give a sec. Um, yes, essentially, you know, so, so the, you know, th this is all the data we collected. Yeah, so we, we changed also the sign of the interactions with it, uh, Kate Savaritin and, uh, well, you know, the, the, the specifications of the machines tell you already that you, should, you shouldn't trust this data, uh, not just due to the coherence, yes, but within this uh, 100 microseconds, we should be coherent. I okay. see. So this, is, this is as much as I can tell you. I don't have uh, exact no, I estimates for it. I understand, yeah, understand. but I wanted, uh, I wanted to remark that if uh, we take one microsecond as a very conservative estimate, uh, then uh, uh, there is a, a qualitative parameter accessibility index, which uh, for this case would be exceeding one. So it will be between two and six, depending on what you're doing. And so, sorry. And uh, uh, so this, uh, from this point of view, the system should be indeed in quantum coherent regime. Okay. So this That's is good. Another yeah. kind of... Uh, that, that's fantastic. Yeah, one, one of the things, uh, you know, also from the theoretical analysis point of view, we use the Landau Center formula. You know, we know 
you know, I guess it's not at the level of qubits, it's really at the level of the single modes. If we were able to estimate the coherence time, we can modify the Landau Center formula and you know also come out with uh, you know, re redo the theory essentially to take into account um, the, uh, the coherence. Yes. Um, yeah. I'm going to add, we'll have a different way to go. I'm going to add something at this stage. Adolfo, could you just please show Andrew King's data, which you showed during your presentation from the D Wave group? Oh, right, right. Yes, this is a very recent. Yes, that, yeah. Uh, yeah, over so, here. So if you look at the left plot here, where they're plotting the kink density as a function of annealing time, and it fits very well to their coherent theory. But only for much shorter, yes, exactly, much shorter yeah. times than you're discussing. So yeah, yeah. Exactly, you know, well, yeah. well, um, well nanoseconds. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Exactly. Yes. Uh, so essentially, the, 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 yeah. The, so I mean, what was uh, some in some sense reassuring or amusing is that you know, I guess going to shorter annealing times. Yes, you can get the behavior consistent with unitary dynamics. I guess it has the issue that you know for annealing, then you are more restricted because you have to do very fast annealing schedules. Yes. Sure, indeed. Okay, I'll um I'll offer a question for Sigato Bose. So what? Hi, Hi Adolfo. How are you? How are you? Good. Very very yeah. interesting. Talk. Yeah. Um. So I was just wondering. So I I don't know exactly. So how good is this approximation of the environment that you took, like individual harmonic oscillator baths with? Uh, in, uh, it's, it's a Markovian bath, I guess you're taking and like a uh, local Markovian bath. Is that? Uh, it's, it's, it has an omic, uh, you know, omic spectral function. Yes. I, mm -hmm. I, I would say that is, I would say, you know, so, so this model, you know, was, was used before and, you know, it's kind of a minimal model, spin bottom model that you can come out. Um, but, um, you know, in some sense, uh, I think there's lots of space to consider all that models. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. what, uh, however, um, if you were to couple uh, oscillators to a different component of the spins, mm -hmm. then uh, this can be fatal. You know, it can be it will give rise to a completely different behavior. It can suppress the phase mm -hmm. transition. You know, here it's very uh, peculiar the feature that uh, the transition is preserved only by altering the critical exponents. But other kind of baths, uh, you know, the, the, the behavior of a critical open quantum system is very rich. There are works by, you know, I remember early works by Santoro, uh, Caneva, I think um, uh, Vicari has been working a lot recently on this. Uh, you know, you can get all kind of behavior. You know, the one that we use, uh, which I think is the default one in, in the context of annealing, has the advantage that, um, you know, it, it explains actually what we see, you know, a, a, a coupling of oscillators to your spin typically is going to do horrible things. For instance, it can induce anti kibitz rate dynamics. This is also something uh, that has been seen in, in other studies where the slower you go, uh, the, the more higher the density of kinks because the, the environment is acting as a, a heating, uh, you know, source, as a source of heat. Right. Um, uh, so, so this, you know, we have studies, for instance, where if, if the kind of noise that you have is in the coupling constant, uh, of the easing chain, you know, say the system is in isolation, but your coupling constants are fluctuating in time, you will have this kind of anti kibitz rate scaling. So, you know, completely different. Instead of having power loss, then you all of a sudden they start to grow. So, you have an optimal annealing time. Yeah? So. Okay. Okay. And just a very quick question. So, temperature is included here, right? So, in, in the in the bath, you, you, you take the bath at a finite right, right. So, so actually the simulations I saw here are at zero temperature, but, um, and I, you know, I, I kill the, you know, just to simplify the number of plots, uh, but, you know, we have also the data for at finite temperature. Mm -hmm. in, in, in this case, uh, it was not sufficient. You know, you could, we could discard it, you know, we could effectively say that we are uh, sort of at zero temperature because at finite temperature, you have a residual density of kinks. Uh, so you, this curves, this power loss flatten out at long annealing times. And we don't see that, you know, in the, you know, they flatten in, in the uh, density is higher than what the ones we see. So we see sort of the power loss continuing until the annealing times we have crop. Um, so, you know, finite temperature is in general bad for, you know, we start in a paramagnet. Yeah? Hopefully that's enough magnetic field so that we are in the brown state. Um, and then we, we go through the first transition. And, uh, you know, if we start in a, uh, if, if, if finite temperature typically hides Kibel Zurich. Uh, it can completely suppress it, yes. Um, because you know you just you are dominated by thermal effects, and you will need to know very carefully what's the thermal component of, of you know the, the thermal density of defects, and subtract that from the you know from the total one to measure 
the little increments due to the non-equilibrium behavior. Uh, yeah, so th this is tricky. For sure, luckily enough, we didn't have to do it here. Um, it is done in other tests of Kibel Zurek, in other experimental platforms. But you know, it's always a bit unsatisfactory because you don't have to assume that the contributions are additive, uh, thermal and non-equilibrium. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. There's, there's a brief comment in the chat from Lorenzo uh, coming to Sigato, Sigato's question: If the total field, the to H total rather, which is the Hamiltonian, I guess, is simulated exactly, I would say it incorporates non-Markovian features for the system. I'm just reading out what the rent said. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, I think I'm fine with that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if that was the question, if 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 your system is, is Markovian or not, I would say it's non-Markovian. I mean. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions for uh, Adolfo? So, so so maybe the, so if it is non-Markovian, then probably I don't know how fast these superconducting fields can be flipped. Where, where people would be trying dynamical decoupling, I guess, also, right? Uh, while doing a, I mean, if if during your ramp you dynamically decouple, does it change uh, the things too much in the dynamics? Uh, yeah, possibly. I, um, I I don't think I have a good answer for that. Yes, I mean you can think of different ways of mitigating the role of the environment. Yes, I guess what the uh, way did was the most natural thing. Just go for shorter and in times. Uh, there, there are you know uh, I will. Yeah, variety of error mitigation, you know, <laughs> the coherence suppression uh, approaches. Yes, yeah, sure. Well, dynamical decoupling will do. I, I will have to think about it. You know, you will have to make sure that it doesn't alter the critical behavior. You know, so yeah, it's, 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 everything's fine. Yeah. Uh, any remaining questions for Adolfo? If not, let's uh, thank Adolfo again for a uh, very stimulating uh, presentation. Thank you, Adolfo. Awesome thank you very much. Thank you. Thank and, you. And uh, that's the end of the yeah. seminar. And uh, next in the seminar is uh, Elliot Caput at uh, midnight um, uh, UTC. So um, look forward to seeing you then. Bye bye, everyone. Cheers. See you. Bye bye.